So continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Michael Strauss. Michael is an accredited genealogist and a nationally recognized genealogical lecturer. A native of Pennsylvania and a resident of Utah, he has been employed as a forensic investigator for 25 years. He holds a BA in history and is a United States Coast Guard veteran and a licensed private investigator. He is also a qualified expert witness in court in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, and approved genealogist with the United States Army to locate DNA qualified persons, MIA, from Korea, Vietnam, and World War II. Uh, he was the film historian for the 2015 Academy nominated film Finding Vivian Mayer. Uh, he has been involved in Civil War reenacting for more than 25 years, serving in two units, namely the 99th New York Infantry and the Battery A. 5th USA Artillery, and most recently the Utah Living History Association. He is the owner of Genealogy Research Network and is also on the board of directors for the Utah Genealogical Association. Uh, his lecture today is titled Manifest Destiny, Researching Your Mexican-American War Ancestors. So without further ado, I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Michael. Thank you, Suzanne. That's appreciated. Great, uh, it's great to be here, Susan. I really, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk with your with your group of students. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, necessarily that military research uh, topics are as uh, readily received at the genealogy level when it comes to instruction, and I think this is something that just uh, a topic that really needs to be talked about. I always start my, start my lectures and begin my lectures always the same. I like to include something that's very visual. I want to put uh, the audience that I'm speaking to into the right uh, frame of mind when it comes to thinking about their topic. And this is an excellent painting that comes from the era of the Mexican-American War. You see pictured here Major Samuel Ringgold, who died at the Battle of Palo Alto in Mexico on May 8, 1846. Now, Ringgold was a regular Army officer and was uh, in the Dragoons, or Cavalry, but he was also kind of an innovator in that he believed that artillery should be used along with the concept of Cavalry. And he came up with this idea of what became known as Flying Artillery, where essentially artillery prior to this was more or less just stationary, so when a battery would set up to, to fire on an enemy position, the battery stayed in one spot. His idea, however, was to take it to the next level, to the next step, if you will. And what he did was he uh, made it so that the batteries could move with the infantry and could move to new positions as the army advanced. So it became known as what was called flying artillery. And it's a, it's a great image to kind of put us into this uh, mindset of the context of time historically, as we think about our topic. So with that said, I think if we're going to talk about the Mexican War, we must have some background information on the war itself. We must have some knowledge of what brought the United States into this war before we can even delve into the records. That's, that's important. So the causes of the Mexican War actually can be traced as early as the Texas War of Independence. You, of course, all know from your history books the famous quote, remember the Alamo, from the 1830s. But that moves forward on our timeline rapidly over the next decade. As that area of Texas becomes more and more involved with the idea that we will now have Texas become a state. Texas does become a state eventually in 1845. It comes in as a slave state. And James Polk, who's elected our president in 1844, essentially is a pro-annexation, and he's also a manifest destiny supporter. Now, the idea behind that, and this is a painting that was done in 1872. It's an allegorical representation of the expansion that was really the idea behind manifest destiny, that everything from sea to sea, Pacific to east uh, to the Atlantic Ocean belongs to us as Americans, and we are therefore entitled to it. This is what Manifest Destiny really at its simplest form really was all about. The Democrats, who were the party of James Polk, supported the war. The Whigs, however, were the 
other party in power. This was the party of Abraham Lincoln at that time, because Lincoln was a young member of the House of Representatives and a Whig politician. They were against the war. So this whole idea really kind of develops, takes shape during this time of the years immediately preceding the Mexican-American War of 1846. Now, again, I mentioned Texas becomes a state in 1845, and shortly after this, there's a border dispute between Texas, our, our now new state of Texas, and the border of Mexico. You can see the arrows are pointed to those two boundaries that I refer to. So the border on the right is the border that is recognized by Mexico, and that's the Nueces River. They recognize that as their border between the United States and Mexico. However, the United States does not recognize the same border. They recognize the border as the Rio Grande River. So you have a, an immediate problem here. You have two separate countries, each recognizing individual and different borders, and you have an area in between, which is essentially no man's land. It's up for grabs. Both countries claim it's theirs. Neither one is willing to concede. Inevitably, you're going to have problems. And the form of those problems took place in what would eventually happen in what was called the Thornton Affair. This is a, an affair in which U.S. cavalry under the command of Captain Seth Thornton, he was a, a dragoon officer, he was attacked by Mexican soldiers on April 25th of 1846 inside that area between both of those rivers. And it was these events that catapulted us into this conflict. So eventually it would be a formal declaration of war. Congress would obviously have to approve this, it would have to be signed off by Congress, and in turn signed by the president. Being that the president was already pro-annexation supporting and was already wanting to get into the war, as were other members of his party, it was certainly no problem to have the to have the standing House and uh, Senate to approve uh, a declaration of war. Most of the fighting eventually would take place between April of 1846 and September of 1847. It was a very short war, less than a year. So you've got uh, you've got a, a period of time when uh, you are talking about uh, a country that's young still in in years. I mean, we're not an old country at that point. But it's really the first time our country is really seen fighting a foreign power outside of the War of 1812. But we're fighting it more domestically, but we're also crossing the border into Mexico. This is the first time we're fighting outside of our own country's border. The war is officially declared on May 14, 1846, and that is the date uh, we know and understand as the start of the Mexican-American War. Now, the war itself, by the end, would permanently establish the Rio Grande River as the border between both countries. Obviously, the losers do not get much choice in this matter, as the winners, the United States, essentially now establish this as the official border. And it really confirms, I think for the most part, to most Americans that Polk is right and that the whole idea of manifest destiny is what, is what we are entitled to. And this was what was believed by the American people. Now, there is another event that's happening in the halls of Congress at this time that I think a lot of people overlook. And it's a, a bill that's introduced in Congress by a representative from Pennsylvania, from Bradford County, Pennsylvania. You see his picture here. It was David C. Wilmot. And he introduced a bill called the Wilmot Proviso. He knew the war wasn't going to last forever. He also knew that the United States was going to be uh, victors in this war. Certainly the Mexicans and the Mexican army was in no military shape to even fight us. They were militarily unprepared to fight against the United States. And it was inevitable who was going to win this war. With that in mind, he proposed to Congress that all of the geographic areas that would be taken in by the United States on account of the war would then ban slavery forever. So all of these geographic areas that would take in 
the all the new states of the United States, I'm talking about eventually California, Utah, all those other states that would be the Southwest, he wanted to see that slavery would be banned permanently. Well, you can see the problem with this and why Congress wouldn't go along with it. And it never passed both the House or the Senate. You have to understand that at this time, the Senate and House was run by the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was also pro-slavery for the most part. So, of course, it would not pass. Instead, what had happened was the Missouri Compromise of 1820 was officially broken with the proviso even being represented in the halls of Congress. This would break that Missouri Compromise. It would no longer exist. It would be it would just be a thing of the past. Instead, what Congress hoped to do instead of voting positive in this proviso was instead to reach another compromise called the Compromise of 1850. Most of you probably are familiar with the Compromise of 1850, at least some of the tenets of that compromise. And that same year that compromise was passed, just a mere few years after Wilmot's proviso, you see California coming in as a free state. This is to keep the balance between the states. So we have Texas coming in as a slave state in 1845, but as part of the compromise, we now have California coming in as a free state. This, of course, would all become interconnected to the years following in the American Civil War starting in 1861. But what I also would like to note that a lot of people don't really think about is that the proviso did two things historically that we must consider, we must think about, because it also affects the genealogy records that we look at. Look at. One of those was, of course, the creation of the Republican Party. It was because of the proviso it led directly to the anti-slavery platformed Republican Party, which is now officially created in 1856 with John C. Fremont running as the very first president under the new party banner. Anyone who thinks Abraham Lincoln was the first Republican candidate for president, they are wrong. It is John C. Fremont. The first candidate to win is Abraham Lincoln in 1860. The other is what is called popular sovereignty. This is another concept that's legal and in the minds of the voters of the time. Because the proviso didn't go through, because the compromise did go through, and therefore obviously the ban on these territories would, would not be permissible, the idea was set forth to create what was called popular sovereignty. This was Lewis Cass from Michigan. This was Stephen Douglas from Illinois. Two northern Democrat senators who came up with this idea that these new territories would now vote for themselves, whether they wanted to be free or slave. It would be left to the voters. Kansas-Nebraska Act was the very first time that was brought into play in 1854. Voters were allowed to vote for themselves. But you can imagine this went a long way to create animosity between both North and the South, which was already tenuous at that point in time, and it only made it progressively worse. Just so we uh, have a little historical context as to the end of the war, the war officially ends February 2nd, 1848, with the signing of what's called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and it essentially ceded to the United States land that would comprise Nevada, California, Utah, as well as parts of Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, and finally Colorado. So you now have the geographic area, the chemistry, if you will, of the southwest part of the United States. We know how it came to pass that this land was acquired through the efforts of our government to win the Mexican-American War. So just historically, I mean, just throw the genealogy stuff out for a moment. Historically, this is a significant time in history. This really sets up what will happen just a mere 13 years later with the start of the Civil War.
Uh, the war, just uh, for your information, the war's casualties by the end of the war, uh, the, we lose in our military arms, we lose 1,773 men killed, and an additional 13,000 plus men die from these. Uh, that's pretty normal, I think, during this time. Obviously, medicine is pretty, uh, not very good. It's almost uh, really in its infancy, I think, in a lot of ways. And uh, men would die from disease much quicker than they would from a battlefield wound. So uh, this was a costly war in that regard, but uh, something that we took from it and learned from it. All right, so that's enough of the history lesson. Let's get into the records themselves that you can search to locate any of your family members that may have served during this conflict. So some of those foundational things that I'm thinking about that will help you both with genealogy and historical research are going to include the following. We're going to certainly want to look at what are called compiled military service records. They are often abbreviated as CMSR. So if you see that abbreviation, you now know that this is this service record for the soldiers. These are volunteer enlistments of men who are sent into the United States Army as a national emergency has arisen. They are volunteers now in federal service. Do not have these men in your mind thinking that these men are strictly state militia. They are not militia. These men are men who were brought into the federal government's military, but started at the state level. So these are volunteers who became regulars for that duration. There are, of course, regular Army enlistment. These are men who had enlisted prior to the start of the war. After the war, they're still enlisted. We're also going to talk about Mexican War pension records and indexes. Obviously, this was a way that the soldiers would get benefits for their time and service. Years after they were out and their widows uh, would be eligible to receive benefits from our government. And those benefits took the form of not only cash, but would also take the form of land as well. Uh, there are also, we're going to also have some discussion on what are called the Old War period. Now, the Old War period historically is 1784 to 1811. Historically, it's between the Revolution and the War of 1812, the, uh, the end of one, the eve of the other. But that is not a hard and steadfast date. When I say Old War period, I'm also referring to those pension records that were filed up through the American Civil War, taking into account all the wars up to that point. It's called the Old War period. Obviously, I had mentioned about bounty land, so if they were not paid in cash money, you could receive and have eligibility to receive bounty land due to the soldier for his military service. Uh, there are, uh, with that, you have to have some knowledge of what are called the land entry case files. These are from the Bureau of Land Management, uh, which is the BLM website, our government website, where you can search the historical records for free online. So when men received bounty land, and I'll get deeper into this, they in turn could assign or sell the land immediately to someone else. From the government to them, it's a government transaction. Once they own the land, it's a private transaction. So they could sell the land immediately to someone else, non-related to the veteran, for cash dollar. That's the land entry case file. There are cemetery records for the veterans, and stone applications for uh, military-issued stones. I also want to take into account some of our other branches. I cannot tell you how many times I have attended lectures on military research dealing with any of these wars from the Revolutionary War onward, and it's only about the Army, as if we had no Navy and we had no Marine Corps and we had no Revenue Cutter Service. And that is the furthest thing from the truth, because we did have those organizations. So I want to talk about the Navy, and in turn, I want to have some discussion on the Marine Corps and some of their records, uh, respectfully. Finally, I want to kind of wind down my time and talk a little bit about Mexican War photography. It's the era of photography. We see our first real photographs being taken in villages, cities, and towns in the late 1830s. Matter of fact, the very first photograph taken of a city in the United States was in Philadelphia, 1839. So photography is very new, and it's exciting to a lot of people. And we see our first real war photographs. So I want to share some of those. 
I want to end out by talking about lineage and fraternal organizations as they relate to Mexican War veterans and or their descendants, taking both sides of that coin. And then finally, I just wanted to end out kind of how, as I start with an image, and I want us to think about how we should know our history, how it is really important to having the facts right and not having someone think for us. We should be thinking for ourselves and have that information clearly embedded into our minds. All right, so now we have our roadmap in which we're to talk about these records. So let's get into them individually one, one at a time. The first set of records are the compiled military service records. All of you should know about this man pictured here on the inset. This is Colonel Fred C. Ainsworth. Fred Ainsworth was appointed the head of the Record and Pension Office uh, in the year 1892. Now, prior to that, uh, in the 1880s, late 1880s, it was called the Record and Pension Division of the Surgeon General's Office. So this was his job, Ainsworth's job. Ainsworth had a team of clerks who worked with him, and every time someone would apply for a pension from prior military service, Civil War, the Indian Wars, the post-Civil War years I'm talking about, uh, or even the earlier ones, the Mexican-American War, or even really old veterans who were still alive at that point, and there were a handful from even the War of 1812, these men would apply for their pensions based on their military service. It was up to Ainsworth and his team of clerks to know if the person's application was legitimate, if it was valid. What he had to do was painstakingly go through all of the military records, which were part of the United States War Department. And they were in his custody. He had charge of those records. And he had to validate each and every claim individually. Now, you can imagine how tedious this had would become, and it did. It took them a long time just to process even a few applications for pensions to be approved. So Ainsworth came up with a really, really great idea. It was brilliant. He came up with an idea to approach the War Department, and he asked to index and catalog and make available to his team those records from all those prior wars from the American Revolution up to that current time. Now, when he did this, the Spanish-American War had not happened yet. The Boxer Rebellion still had not happened, and the Philippine Insurrection had not happened. Those wars did not exist at that moment in time. So he was given approval to do this. This is not regular army. These were all volunteer soldiers from all the prior wars. What he did was he indexed and cataloged them and made it so much easier to know that the men would be eligible to receive their pensions. He started carting the Mexican War, the Civil War, and the Indian Wars. They were complete very early on by 1894. And then he began later on the War of 1812 and the Revolutionary War. Now, I know this is not part of our topic, but I'm just going to add this little mention. I, I think it's important that we know. So the Revolutionary War is the only one that's kind of odd about his set of records that he indexed. Because the, the Revolutionary War had a loss of records, a serious loss of records. On November 8th of 1800, the War Department caught fire. The whole first floor of the War Department was destroyed. With it, most of the War Department records that would have carried these service files for men that were federalized, essentially. And what he did was he went to the Department of State, he went to the Department of Interior, he went to the Department of Treasury to essentially reconstruct those lost files. And that's what he was able to do. The later wars that I had mentioned, the Spanish-American War, Boxer Rebellion, Philippine Insurrection, eventually the timeline wound up that the war would start, and he was still working on these older wars, and he wound up finding time to work on those wars as well. The difference being is he indexed and cataloged those wars in real time. Literally, as the events were happening, as men were being discharged, he was literally filing this information and cataloging and indexing it and stamping it on the back of each and every uh, muster roll on uh, the forms that he had. So he did a fantastic job. After this was all done in the early 1900s, he went back to the War Department and asked if he could do the regular Army, and the War Department turned him down and said, no, we don't wish for you to do this, and eventually he wound up being cashiered out of the Army. So. We are grateful 
to him. And I think as genealogists, we and historians, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to this man. Once this COVID problem is over in our country, and if you have the opportunity to travel back east to the archives, the National Archives in Washington has all these records that he indexed. They think of him so highly that they have a room at the archives called the Ainsworth Room. Ask to see it. Go into the Ainsworth Room. See the room that was named after him. You'll be glad you did. All right. So the records themselves all look the same. He indexed and cataloged these identically for each and every war period from the Revolution up to the Philippine Insurrection. They all look identical. There are few exceptions. I mean, there are some changes, minor, small changes, but they look the same. Here's an example of a Mexican War era soldier. This is William Grave from the state of Pennsylvania. It gives you obviously the name of the soldier, his military unit, and the war period. So it, it goes right down to the company level. He doesn't say and end it at the second Pennsylvania infantry. He gives you the company, company A of the second Pennsylvania infantry. He also does not uh, mix words when it comes to the war period because he understands and realizes that there are many men with common names. Would it not be difficult to search John Smith and find hundreds and thousands, presumably, of this men by the same name, and you could rule out men based on the war period and not have to look at those men because you know it's not the correct war. Did that as well for us. This is important. He included what was called the rank in and the rank out. So this was the rank that the man enlisted as, going in as, and their rank out. So William Grafe was enlisted as a corporal, came in as a corporal, and was commissioned at some point in his military service and was discharged with the rank of second lieutenant. Rank in and rank out. Anything could have happened in between. You won't know until you look inside the record. This is a hard cardboard pouch that literally opens up and has files inside of it. There are these files that I refer to are the card numbers. You see here that are, there are 10 card numbers listed. Each of them is, is uh, individual. Each of them is not been repeated. So they're unique card numbers. And on the back of each card within the pouch, are stamped these card numbers in red ink, which you can't miss, and next to it is a stamp in which the date he entered it into record. So you've got two stamps on the back, the card number and the date it was entered. If for some reason you are missing one of the card numbers, well, certainly you'll know one thing. You'll know that you do not have a complete file. You need to, therefore, see the rest of the file. You could go to the military archivist in National Archives at Washington, you could show them this card is missing. Say it's the last card, card number 10. You could show them that, yes, this card is missing. I therefore request to see the rest of this file. They would have to then pull the original muster rolls that Ainsworth used to index because it's not complete. Something had happened. A card was lost over time. You know, it had been well over 100 years. Things get lost. But you have now recourse to be able to do that. Near the bottom, we have a couple other details asked, the number of personal papers. This is always important. If the soldier was captured during the war and made prisoner, if the soldier was killed, wounded, anything like that, that's a casualty record, a casualty report. If the soldier was transferred or commissioned, anything outside of the routine, there are personal papers. There's a laundry list of different types of papers. It's in an envelope within the pouch. You'll easily be able to find that. William Grafe does not have any personal papers. Uh, his file just simply didn't include any. There is a bookmark notation as well. This is also not filled out for Grafe, but if you ever, ever see this bookmark notation, number, write it down. It is important. This is a separate file separate from the service record. When Ainsworth and his clerks found errors in the record or wanted to make corrections of some sort, or if records were added years later down the road, 
the Adjutant General's Office, or AGO, would mark the record and create a separate file number. It would often be preceded by RNP, Record and Pension, a year, a file number. That's how you would see it. You simply request the file number based on the bookmark notation, the number that's displayed. All they need is the number and the name, nothing more. And you simply tell them it's a bookmark file. You cannot get that anywhere but on site at the archives. These are not digitized. These are not scanned. These are not otherwise available. And finally, the last file uh, on this sheet is any sort of alias that the soldier may have used. Men might enlist under other names or an assumed name. Typically, this is usually thought to be like men who would enlist and then desert and then re-enlist under another name. But there's a number of reasons that men would have an assumed alias. Uh, so just make note, and if there is another name, check under the other name as well for that file. Not all of the records are digitized for the Mexican War. In your syllabus, I've noted several of the states, Pennsylvania being one of them, Mississippi is another, some of the Creek uh, and Indian nations uh, that were attached to the military had service members, and those cards are digitized along with the Mormon Battalion. But the rest of the states in the United States are not, for the most part, digitized. There are index cards. I've given you the link to that in the handout as well. You can see the index cards, but you're not going to be able to see the full record unless they are fully digitized, like the handful of states that I had already mentioned. Now let's get a look inside, just so you can see what the inside looks like. So here's an example of two cards that would be located in the record. You obviously have someone who's mustering in, and you have someone that's mustering out. You have a muster in and a muster out card. The muster out card makes note that this individual was promoted from corporal to first sergeant to second lieutenant and gives the dates of promotion. It's a remark. It's his mustering out card. It's telling us the end of his service, but the rank that he had achieved at the end of his military service. Then there are regular muster rolls. These are company muster rolls. These were typically done in two-month increments. So generally, January and February are usually kept together. March and April and May and June and so forth throughout the calendar year. The one on the right is March and April of 1847. And the one on the left is really January and February of 1847. But they wrote the dates out, the exact dates, where they just listed the month on the right. Sometimes the ranges are a little longer, three, four, even five or six months. I've seen ones from the War of 1812 that are essentially the duration of the war. So you have it listed differently in some wars. Just know that it's not hard and steadfast. But that's the general rule. Now, again, I want to point out to a remark. You can see the boxed remark that William Grafe, at some point, was sent to a hospital at Jalapa, Mexico, on April 28, 1847. Now, it doesn't state why. It doesn't tell me why he was sent to the hospital. Was he wounded? Was it illness? Was it just something in the line of duty? It's not specific on the remarks. But it does tell you that there's a microfilm roll to look at. You, in turn, could look at the medical records which are also housed at the National Archives, to get that information. I do know, however, that it's not a casualty in the regard that he was wounded, because if that hospital visit would have been on account of a wounding, there should have been a casualty sheet in his personnel papers, which would have been part of this file. But because there was not, then I know it's not from a battlefield wound. He was probably sick. That's what brought him into the hospital. But if I wanted to know those details, I have yet another place that I can search. There is also, uh, for the Mexican War period at least forward, you're going to be hard-pressed to find this for previous wars. So the Revolution and the War of 1812, I have seen them, but they are few and far between. The Mexican War was really the first war we see this legitimately used regularly. We see what's called a regimental descriptive book, just as the name implies. It gives you the age of the veteran, the name, their height, their complexion, their eye color, their air color, their occupation, their residence, their place of birth, all of that information. 
something short of a photograph. I know what the veteran looks like physically, but I don't have a picture. But that's okay. I still have a good physical description. And the reason they started to do this was to apprehend deserters. What better way to apprehend a deserter if you have a good description of the deserter? I also want to make note of another remark, which is essentially his enrollment information, because they put the enrollment and mustering in information here. They are separate. They are not the same. You enroll into the military unit, but then you are officially mustered in, where you, know, you raise your hand, where to defend the Constitution, that sort of thing. That all happens in the mustering ceremony. But you enroll with the intent to become a soldier. That's separate, not together. And he was enrolled on December 23rd, 1846 in Reading, Pennsylvania. And he was enrolled by Captain Thomas Loser, his company commander. The entire unit was commanded by Colonel John Geary, pictured on the right, in his Mexican War era uniform as a young colonel. Uh, Geary would actually go on to serve in the Civil War and would be wounded uh, more than 10 times during the American Civil War. How that man survived is beyond me. And later, uh, post-Civil War years, he wound up being governor of Pennsylvania. So he had quite a colorful career his entire, his entire adult life. So I had mentioned about personal papers, and I wanted to find one to share with you. So this is Private Washington Kramer of the 1st Pennsylvania Infantry, that same unit that Gray belonged to, just a different man from uh, a different company. And this is what was called a volunteer enlistment form. This should have been in Grave's file. He was a volunteer. He had enlisted voluntarily, but for whatever reason, the form was not included. Maybe it was never filled out. Maybe it was lost, but it should have been included, and this is what the form looked like. It was signed by the soldier, sent to a surgeon who, in turn, would, would sign the man off as being physically healthy enough to serve, and it came with a physical description that they took and put onto the descriptive role that I had shared with you in the previous slide. That's where the information came from. You do know a few things about the individual besides the fact that they had voluntarily enlisted. Two things that I can immediately think of is you get the residence of the person. So not only do you know where they're born, you get their residence. So Washington Kramer, no matter where he was born, doesn't matter. We know that he lived in Chambersburg in Franklin County, Pennsylvania. That was his physical residence. He should be in city directories. He should show up in federal census records. He should have a family there. He should have a connection to someone in his family in that area. I get that pertinent piece of information. Plus, if you look about a third of the way down the form, you can see that Washington Kramer was illiterate. He could not sign his own name. He wrote his mark. You'll know if your ancestor could sign the name. That's obviously very important. Now, I wanted to just kind of mention about militia uh, as well. Now, there are states that had their own militia records. So not every state had men that were all federalized. In some cases, well, in most cases, actually, the states volunteered more men than what the government could take in. This was a very patriotic war. One of the very first slides had an image of a man reading a newspaper and the picture was called the war news. The country was very excited about this war. Remember, the idea of manifest destiny was in the minds of our public. And of course, they believed everything that was behind that, that if we fight, we can therefore get. And because of that, most states had an overabundance of men who volunteered. But our government said, look, we can only take X number of regiments. Pennsylvania had enough men to garner 10 regiments, but could only take two. And that was where they ended their recruitment at the federal level. But the rest of the men were local militia. So please check your local state records. So in Pennsylvania, those are kept at the Pennsylvania Archives, and they have a series of books called the Pennsylvania Archives series. You can search men by name. You can know details about them and when and where they enlisted, if they were called up for service. These include men that were called up and also men that were never called up and remained militia at their local state level and never left the state. You got them thrown together in the same exact record. 
Now, let's just turn our minds to the regular army. I just covered the volunteers, but let's talk about the regular army since we need to have some uh, working knowledge of those records, too. So the regular army's records cover 1798 to 1914. That's the series that's indexed and on Ancestry and on Family Search. I've given you the links to both in your syllabus. So I'm interested in Charles Bennett, and Charles Bennett is the second one from the bottom, and you get a lot of the same information you would find in Ainsworth's records. You'll get the name, their age, their physical description, their birthplace, their occupation, the enlistment details. That's page one. Page two includes even more information. It tells us how long they were enlisted for. So he was enlisting for a period of five years, which is generally outside of the norm because most men enlisted for four-year periods. Why five years? I, I don't know. It must have been something at that time that they allowed for an additional year of, of service, but typically it was a four-year enlistment. And then it tells us and goes on to tell us that our guy was assigned to three companies at, in his service, Company I, Company G, Company F, all of the third United States regular army infantry. He got out at the discharge of his service in 1846. But interestingly, it also mentioned at one point, at least in his career, that he had deserted the Army in 1843 and was reapprehended in the same year in 1843. So he was AWOL and a deserter from April of 1843 through August of 1843. And it tells us that right in this record. Now, this is just the beginning step to the regular army service. You want to go beyond that, there are medical records, there are payroll records, there are forts, there are any place that these men were stationed at, any location where they were at, there are going to be additional records all found for the most part, with the exception of the treasury records. The treasury records are going to be in record group 217. The rest of the records will be in record group 94. So those are the adjutant general's office records, 94, which take into account these regular army enlistment and all the additional documents to go with that. All right, we've talked about the army. We'll get into the Navy and we'll get into the Marine Corps just a little later. But I do want to make note that once you've established service, your next logical step would, of course, be to look at a pension. That's your next logical place to go. So you should know some stuff about pension records. I've included, again, links in your handout, some of the pension records and the laws. I think you should read the law because you'll know exactly how your ancestor came to apply for the pension. They had to have a certain amount of time in service. Maybe there was criteria that they had to have served in a specific branch or they were officer or enlisted. All of this was parameters which are funneled into the pension law. Read the acts. Now, pensions were first granted to soldiers immediately after the end of the Mexican War, but they were limited. They were limited to those men who had died in service or to veterans who were disabled as a result of their military service. Now, what you're looking at here is not that time period. This is a record from what's called the Congressional Record, our statutes at large, our laws that govern the United States, passed by Congress, all written up, still used today, statutes at large. You can look up the definition. And this is a page from the Pension Act for Mexican War Pension years, dated 1887. The general pension index for men to be approved for pensions was not passed until 1887. Think about that. You are looking at 40 years after the end of the Mexican War before the very first index is created and very first law is created for men to apply for their Mexican War pension if they were not disabled or killed as a result of their military service back in the 1840s, where someone else would be applying for them. They had to wait till the 1880s. So you can imagine there were 
much less veterans still living at that time. Let me give an example of a pensioner, kind of tell you a little bit about his story, and I can show you his records, just to give you an idea of how much rich genealogical information is found inside of these pension files. So this is Peter Allabach. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1824 in a little town called Wilkes-Barre. By the way, that is how it's pronounced, not a typo error. And he had enlisted in the U.S. regulars and had served in Company E of the 3rd U.S. Infantry. And through the war, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant, and that was how he got out. He was discharged in 1849 and was a civilian again until the start of the Civil War. In 1862, he was commissioned a colonel of the 131st Pennsylvania Volunteer Regiment. This was a nine-month unit. It was only intended to serve for nine months. The men would then be uh, discharged. His regiment wound up fighting at the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862, and he wrote an open letter to the War Department and claimed that after the battle that his unit got closer to the gates of hell than any other unit that was on the field that day engaged. And the losses that were uh, kept, or well, happened to his unit, certainly reflected uh, his statement. Uh, he, his, uh, his unit took quite a beating. He wound up dying in 1892 in Washington, D.C., and he wound up being buried in Arlington National Cemetery. So that's his kind of a little snapshot of his life. His pension index record is found online. These are, uh, I have the links online for you to search these, and you can search for them and look for them, but know that you're looking at a Mexican war veteran because it will tell you. You can distinguish this man from a Civil War veteran. He actually had a Civil War pension, which was filed later, but he filed a separate Mexican War pension application for his separate service. So in essence, he has two. And because of that, it was filed under both him and it was also filed under his wife. So there are two index cards in the same exact indice pointing to the same person. The one just lists him on the left. You can see on the corner of the right sides of the cards, clearly stamped in black ink is the words Mexican War. So we know what war it is. We know the service. And below that, it lists his service information. E Company, 3rd Infantry of the U.S., 3rd Regular U.S. Infantry. The card on the right is the dependent card. It includes him and his wife's name, which the other did not, and it includes additional information, a little bit different numbers, which are the file numbers that I'm referring to. It gives you that detail. But at the bottom, take a look at the bottom. It also says here, late war, widow's original, and then a number, and then it has Colonel 131st Pennsylvania Infantry. So that tells me there's yet another card in this same series of indexes with the regiment from the Civil War, because it's all found in the same general index covering 1861 to 1934. I know that. So there are multiple cards for this guy. We look into the pension itself. We have an invalid's claim. An invalid is the soldier. That's the pensioner, the man himself. The widow is obviously the wife of the veteran, and they were pensioned under the same act of 1887. It so states that on the front of the cards. You can see the numbers. You can also see an additional series of numbers. Now, I'm going to guess that my mouse will probably move over top of your screen. I'm hoping you can all see this. I have circled and boxed in a series of additional numbers outside of this stamped set of numbers, 10510, 13780. These are the pension numbers on the card you saw previously. But this third series of numbers, you see the abbreviations BL number 68104-160-47. That is the bounty land. This man applied for land in addition to cash money pension. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to use our same example for him, but I'm going to show you his bounty land file. Well, so let's break into his pension a little deeper. This is just the beginnings of the pension. So the pension would include examples of, say, a pension brief. This is the widow verifying the service of her former husband. If it's a brief, a brief is a legal term, and a brief is essentially a condensed statement of fact telling us the, the facts of, of what we need to share. That It's just a factual statement put into a document form. It's a brief. And she is stating her husband's information so she can obtain his pension. Additionally, you would often have witnesses, men that the soldier typically served with, men that knew him personally, that fought side by side with him, that would often put information into these pension files and in turn would be used to have the pension approved. Because what better way to have a pension approved than to have someone you fought with state that you were there in battle with them? This is the kind of information you find in the pension. Additionally, there are going to be a lot of genealogy details. <coughs> Excuse me. So the marriage date and place of the widow to the soldier is a statement found in the pension file, dated by the widow, attested to, given the information, and verified, often with the signature or statement from the minister that had married them. And then often it comes with sealed documents, like the record on the right. This is to certify that the widow was born in Port Blanchard, Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, December 24th, 1829. So not only do we know that the veteran was born a specific date and that he died on a date, specific date, we also get genealogy information about his wife. We know when she was born. We know when she died. The record on the left indicates additional death information. So it comes with lots and lots of great genealogy information. Now, let's say you've done the search in the general index and you didn't find your person, no worries. You have a second index. I mentioned to you at the very beginning, when I talked about our foundational records, that you'll want to look at the second index for pensions. These are the Old War Index. 1815 to 1926 is the range of years that the index covers, but really it's for service prior to the year 1861, prior to the Civil War. It's based on military service from the War of 1812, the Indian Wars, the Mexican War, the regular army, all those that belong to all the other branches as well. You will find Revenue Cutter Service, Marine Corps, Navy, also included in these card indexes. How you'll be able to distinguish one branch from another, the Navy and the Marine Corps cards, and revenue color service cards are typically darker in color. The cards are a little bit different texture altogether. You will know and distinguish between that and the Army's cards. So just know there is some differences in cards. The example I have here is William Cotton. And you see here he has an AKA name, William Smith, Battery A of the 2nd U.S. Artillery a regular army artillery battery. Again, look for the letters Old War lettered on the upper right corner of your index, just like the words Mexican War from the previous index cards. So, when you look at the pensions, then your next step is to want to look to see if the soldier might have received some sort of bounty land. Remember, they were often entitled to it. So not only did they get the pension, they were often granted bounty land. I'm going to tell you flat out that a lot of these men never intended to settle the land. The intent was to get the land because they were entitled to the land. They had served their country honorably. And they were entitled to what they were to receive from our government. It was a benefit owed them. But most men would wind up selling the land outright to someone else, assigning it, if you will, but it still was a paperwork process that had to be gone. So the act to cover the Mexican War era bounty land records 
are from the Bounty Land Act of 1847. It's right at the end of the war. You can see the statute at large. You can see the actual congressional information, 9 Stat 125. That's the chapter of Congress followed by the word statute, which is condensed, page 125. Read the law. It's also referred to what was called the Ten Regiments Act. And this came from the number of regiments that had served during the course of the war. It was just a name that was used to to um, to honor and to uh, signify that these men were Mexican War era pensioners who were going to then be entitled to bounty land. This was followed by three additional acts, 1850, 52, and 55. The last act of bounty land granted was the act of 1855. So by the time the Civil War starts, Bounty land is a thing of the past. We are not granting bounty land, although in truth, bounty land was still being sought after, even though men hadn't applied for it, even up into the 1920s and the 1930s. So really, it took a long time for it all to be divvied out. The paperwork trail, that red tape of government red tape, took decades. But as far as applying for it to take those decades, you had to end by 1855. The act would allow for the men to collect 160 acres. And in turn, they could receive uh, a less than allotted uh, time and could also receive 40 acres. So there were certain types of allotment that were allowed to the men when it came to the bounty land. Again, I always revert to please just read the law. There are Mexican War Era Bounty Land Indexes online. There's a general index and then there's an unindexed index. Well, that sounds like an oxymoron, but and it kind of does sound like one. But there was an additional set of records that were located later that were never indexed, and then they were finally indexed years down the road. So there are actually two sets of indexes. This is Peter Allabach, but you'll note his name is actually misspelled. It doesn't, it has with A, his last name is spelled A-L-L-A-B-A-C-K. Well, his last name was actually spelled A-L-L-A-B-A-C-H, which is more or less the Pennsylvania version of the surname, which is more of a Pennsylvania Dutch spelling of the surname. But everything else matches. And you'll note here that the bounty land numbers match up exactly what's found on that same card that was found inside of his pension record, stating to me that not only did he have the pension, he was also granted the bounty land. And because of that, they threw those records together. So if you break down that set of numbers now, now you have a little bit of knowledge of what the numbers mean. Obviously, the 47, and they reverted, they, they have the numbers, by the way, opposite of one another. Here on the index online, they have the year followed by the acres followed by the file number, and they have it here, just complete opposite. Just so you know, and for the record, it's the correct way is actually the latter. By way of the file number, followed by the acreage, followed by the year of the Bounty Land Act, the year of 1847. I will tell you also that of all the Mexican War era bounty acts, the one from 1855, the last one, was the one most amenable to the veterans. It was the easiest one to be approved. It had less hoops to jump through. There was virtually no time in service, but often just a few weeks. The men had to have served the least amount of time. They didn't have to have any wounding. They didn't, uh, there was not lots of criteria and parameters as the other acts you will read about. It was the easiest one to get approved. When you look at the record, the bounty land file will be different. It will be a different record altogether. You can see it comes from the National Archives. You see the name, Peter Allabach. You see the Bounty Land Act of and the file number. It's an actual yellowed, large, eight and a half by 11 size. Well, it's a little larger, probably more or less uh, 12 by 10 by 12 envelope, actually, just slightly larger. And inside are all these documents and papers that relate directly to the bounty land application. And part of that included in his application his oath, his 
volunteer enlistment form is a volunteer enlistment form which should have been placed into his compiled military service record actually never made it into the file. Or, well, in his case, it wouldn't have been a compiled military service record because he enlisted the regulars. But because he had enlisted in the service, he has his enlistment papers thrown in to the bounty land to show that he had indeed served in the military. If this was a volunteer, I would not be shocked to find his volunteer enlistment form in here as well, either a copy or the only record, and it was never placed into the other, like William Grace's record was. It was simply missing from his file, maybe because he had a bounty land file. Once you've done that, you'll want to go to the next step. Once you've established bounty land, you've established pension, you've established service, you've established bounty land. If you believe the veteran got the land and didn't keep it, which again was the likely likelihood was high, you next want to search what are called the land entry case files. Now these are found in record group 49. This is not a military collection of records. You are looking at civilian records. This is the civilian side of our of our government. This is not military, but it has a lot of military stuff in it because they 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 cross boundaries, they cross paths. You almost have to incorporate one with the other, depending on how the land was acquired, whether that land was cash sale, civilian cash sale, or outright military service. The point is this office would have it. These records are located on site only at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. They have not, I repeat, not been digitized. So search on the Bureau of Land Management's website, and I'm going to share with you some slides showing you the website, what it looks like, and actually what you've got to fill out. So you fill in the name search. I searched for Peter Allabach. I did my full-blown search of a patent. They're warrants, but they're called patents also. It's just another name for them. So when you see the word warrant and patent, they're synonymous with one with the other. And then I conducted my search, hoping for a match. I only found one match, not a common name. There are two people mentioned here. You see the names of Heaster Stevens and Peter H. Allabach listed together. Allabach is the soldier getting the bounty land. Heaster Stevens is the, land, is the man who Allabach sold the land to. The first private sale between one individual to another, grantor, grantee. But he's still listed here. He's selling the land to him after he receives it from the government. When you click on the live link, which is next to this image right here, this area right here, this will supply you with all the details. There's a lot of information on this one screenshot. You get the type of patent. It's military. We know how the patent came to be possessed, how it came to, to happen. We get the names on the documents, the two men's names I mentioned. We get the warrant number. We get the acreage. We get the patent act. All of that should match the pension file and the bounty land file, 68104-160-47. If you look on the screen, you see they match up exactly. Letter for, or excuse me, number for number. Above that, you have a land office, Mineral Point where the land was acquired. It was a local land office where this was filed. And then finally, at the very bottom, you get a physical land description along the fourth principal meridian. You can also see at the bottom left here is the word map. If it's working, and it doesn't always work, just know that you can now map your land in question. So there's also one other thing that you can touch up here. It's called the patent image, circling that right now, the patent image. There is, however, one document that has been scanned. This is a copy of the patent image stating that the United States of America was granting to Peter H. Allabach, Sergeant and Captain Van Horn's company of the 3rd Regiment of United States Infantry based on his military service during the late Mexican 
war. Below that gives you the full land description. Remember, this is public land states. You're going to get a public land state description. This is not going to be a meets and bounds description like the original 13 colonies. To the creek, to the tree, to the stone, so many rods, so many perches. Not going to be listed the same. This is a public land state. These are going to start with a meridian and a baseline, and it's going to break down to a township range, and it's going to break it down even further to the aliquot parts. It's going to right down to that specific area. The map will help you understand where the land is physically located. We knew from the display on the previous slide from the Bureau of Land Management's website that the land was physically located in Grant County, Wisconsin. You can see the fourth principal meridian. You can see the baseline that's extended as part of the fourth principal meridian. You see where they cross on that lower left side of the Wisconsin down near the bottom, that yellowed area where they cross each other. Uh, again, just with my arrow pointing to that small area here where they cross. That's the area in which we start our township and range information. So many townships north and so many ranges east and west. To the point where we can then on the map on the right place the area in particular and know exactly where that map area is on a map then and today and could place that farm or that piece of tract of land on a modern day 2020 Google Earth map. All of that can be done from this one website. All right, so that's the bounty land. Let's kind of wind down our time with this, our last handful of sources. First of which I'm going to cover our Veterans Grave Administration records. So veterans grave records are for burials of men who had served in the military. And I want to make particular note of these two individuals, and they're very separate. The one on the left was a government-supplied stone, government-supplied. How do I know that? It's because from 1879 to 1903, the government issued these stones based on applications. This is the application of William C. Bradley with his military information carved into the stone from the application where he's to be buried and the Vermont Marble Company, which was one of a dozen contractors who supplied these government issued stones, would contract to perform the work. What you should know about these stones and that index is read the application. These were really only intended for Union veterans of the Civil War. It was what was called the shield design. Take a look at the stone a little closer. You can see what appears to be the design of a shield used, whoop, used within the stone. It's the shield design stone. Confederates were not given the uh, ability to be buried in cemeteries through government issued stones until the year 1906. And even then you had to be a prisoner or in a hospital. And it wasn't until 1929 that Confederates all across the board could be issued stones, government stones. So just know that the index covers Civil War, but includes other wars as well. The one on the right is for a U.S. Marine, Ebenezer Shirley. His stone has carved in information about the Mexican War, but it's not a government-issued stone. However, we have a marker that was issued by a county where he was buried. That was a county level or a state level, but the stone itself was not issued by our federal government, like the one on the left. Just a little piece of trivia with the left stone as well. The shield design went away in 1925. They changed it to another upright type design that was used and had uh, a religious symbol that was attached to it at that point that was allowed. And uh, the reason being that the shield design went away was because our Bureau of Highways took over the shield design and it became the design for our interstate highways. That's how the stone design changed in 1925. So uh, just a, 
a little, as Paul Harvey used to say, now you know the rest of the story. I also want to share with you one locally that's clearly not a government stone. That's not a church-issued stone of any sort. This is Samuel Bowksher, who enlisted in the Army and was accidentally killed at the beginning of the war in May of 1846. What you're looking at on the right is a Pennsylvania record, a Pennsylvania application for a burial of a veteran from all wars in Pennsylvania, from the colonial era right up to the present, kept at the county level, with a duplicate kept at the state level, state level for the whole state. His has nothing to do with having a government-issued stone, neither at the federal, state, or local level. The private stone. You can clearly tell. This is an old, old sandstone tombstone. And it was just whoever made it put the information on the, of the individual. But the person was also a veteran. And because of that, they had their name recorded in yet another set of documents. Let's just talk briefly about the other two branches. First, I'm going to mention about the Navy. So the Navy had an equivalent to the compiled military service records, and they were called rendezvous reports, as the name implies. You rendezvous, you come together at a place, a rendezvous, and you report for duty to sign up. And the men had to state in the report whether they were joining the Navy or what was called the Coast Survey Service. There was actually a column for that. It gives the same physical description, the same occupation, place of birth, as you would find on the compiled military service records for the Navy as well as for the Army. But you've got to go through the index first. So this is an example of a rendezvous report index card covering 1846 to 1891. There's a separate index for the Civil War years, 61 to 65. So it really covers 1846 to 1860 and 1866 to 1891 in the same index. You see John Myers. He rendezvoused, enlisted at Norfolk, Virginia. He enlisted on and enrolled on January 15, 1846. His service was on board the USS Mississippi, which was a side wheel steamer at that time of his service. He was killed uh, accidentally by the discharge of a cannon on board the ship, and he would have records in yet other locations found within the Navy records at the archives. But this is the card index that puts me next to look at the rendezvous report itself and the receiving ship records and all of the other documents that have his full naval service, muster rolls and everything. This is the starting point. If you're a Marine, you want to go directly to the muster rolls or what are called size rolls. The Navy, uh, Marine Corps rather, has their equivalent of the compiled military service records, and these are called size rolls. They contain a lot of the same information as the CMSRs. They cover 1798 to 1901. But the muster rolls will place you on a specific ship, the detached marine, or place you at a fort or a duty station. And it's all alphabetical within the muster rolls. Once you find them on the size roll, look at the muster roll. You need to do both steps. The example I have here, and these muster rolls you can see, cover 1798 to 1951. They are on Ancestry, and they are an amazing collection. So this is uh, Robert Tansill, who served as a Marine uh, in the 1830s and into the 1840s during the Mexican War. He resigned in 1861 when he was serving on board the USS Congress and joined the Confederate Marine Corps with the rank of captain. So he served in the U.S. Marine Corps when the war begins because he's a native Virginian. He resigns his commission and becomes a Confederate and serves in the newly formed Confederate Marine Corps. Very few people even realize that there was a Confederate Marine Corps, but there certainly was such an organization. Very small, but there was an organization. If you look at the muster roll, you can see him here listed as number one on our list. It gives us his name and his rank. All of the other information should have been filled out, but for whatever reason, whoever filled this information out did not 
complete the information. They never uh, finished it, and uh, the, some of these muster rolls are simply incomplete. But it still places your man at a time when they would have served in the Marine Corps and the ship or duty station where they were attached. Now, let's just uh, end out by talking about our last couple of things, which are the photographs and uh, veterans organizations post-war. And the first of which are photos. I love love pictures. I, I buy and sell images all the time, and I love historic images because I get so much joy out of being able to figure out who they are. That's the kind of images I like to buy. I like to buy images where I don't know what, the, what I'm looking at, and I try to solve the problem, I try to solve it myself. So the Mexican War is really the first conflict that we see modern photography being used to not only take pictures of men, but of events. So the picture on the right is just a daguerreotype taken of General William Worth uh, in, Mexi in the Mexican War. The picture on the left is General John Wool with his staff, uh, you know, just going down a city street in Saltillo, Mexico in the year 1847. Uh, don't you just love the picture of the dog on the right? Uh, you can barely see it there, but there is a, a dog in the image as well. Let me uh, have a little fun with all of you and kind of test your Mexican War slash Civil War photographic knowledge. I have four men pictured here above the bar. See if you can tell me who they might be. I know you're not going to be able to talk, but you certainly can uh, type in your chat box or chat log or whatever they call that, you can certainly type in who you believe it is. So the man on the left, anybody have any idea who that is? By chance, if I give you a little bit of a clue. So the man on the left is a young second lieutenant, or well, actually he was a first lieutenant in this picture, in the first United States artillery. Later on, he would go in to serve in the American Civil War and would be killed at the Battle of Chancellorsville shortly afterwards in May of 1863. This was a Clarksville, Virginia native, uh, none other than this man, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, or otherwise known as Stonewall Jackson, uh, his military nickname during the Civil War. The next on our right is a young man pictured in uh, civilian attire, I don't have him in uniform, just none that I realized that have existed. And he was a major in the 3rd Kentucky Infantry during the late Mexican War. He was a militiaman who would be commissioned. Afterwards, he got into politics. He would wind up becoming the vice president under James Buchanan. So two of these men would become presidents in this image. One would serve as the vice president. This man would serve as a vice president. Later, he would serve in the American Civil War and was commissioned a general in the Confederate Army, and he was in command of what was called the Orphans Brigade. Does anybody know who this might be? And if you guessed correctly, this is John B. Breckenridge of Kentucky. The third man pictured on our right was actually born Hiram, but he not, did not go by that name. That was his birth name. And he served as a captain in the 4th United States Infantry during the late Mexican War. Of course, would go on to serve in the Civil War and become obviously very famous and later on would become President of the United States. And as you certainly know, this individual is Ulysses Simpson Grant. I don't know if any of you knew his birth name was actually Hiram. Ulysses Grant. Uh, by the way, this is an image of Grant, which very few people get to see. This is Grant with a beard that looks much different than the one that we're accustomed to. It almost appears to me to be sort of pasted on, like he had a, an additional piece of his beard sewn on for good measure. This looks so out of place. And uh, this was Grant at the very beginning of the Civil War as a newly commissioned colonel. The last man pictured on the right uh, served as a colonel in the 9th United States Infantry. His was a political appointment, though. And he later went on to serve as President of the United States from 1852 to 1856, when, of course, James Buchanan became our president. 
And if you guessed correctly, you knew that this was Franklin Pierce. All four of these men had something in common. All four served in the ranks of the military during the Mexican War, went on to other things later on in their lives. Our last thing that we'll discuss before we end is some organizations, some veteran organizations. The first of which you might want to consider looking into is called the Aztec Club of 1847. This was organized historically by officers of the Mexican War at the end of the war in 1847. These detail military information about the late war, campaigns, uniforms, battles, and links to lots of historical information is found on their website. And they have a full list of all those men who were members of the Aztec Club. Now remember, you had to be an officer of either the volunteer army or the regular army to have served and have been eligible for membership. And this organization was a social organization. That was their initial purpose. But over time, it turned into a, a heraldry organization. They do, however, have a free online database where you can search for the names of men who were members of this organization. The first name is optional. However, the surname, of course, is not. I searched for the surname of Armstrong, looking for this man, Lieutenant uh, Bielzeliel, I guess that's how you pronounce his name, Armstrong, pictured at the time of the Mexican War. Love the uniform. That's just an absolutely beautiful uniform from the National Archives. And it gave me his details. There were 12 men named Armstrong. He was the second one on our list. When I clicked on View Details, you see it right here, I've arrowed it. It pulled up all of his information on his military service, his rank, his unit he served in, when and where he served, even right down to information regarding his death and at what age he died. This was a organization, again, social, meant for officers. But if you were enlisted, you could not join that previous organization. There is, however, a lineage group that is still operating today. It's a fully functional group organized in 1989 in Richardson, Texas, and it's used to aid members in perpetuating the history of the Mexican War. They obviously want people to join. It's eligible for both men and women because they have a female auxiliary. That's the female women arm, and they promote grave registration. They have publications. They have conferences yearly, and they meet at the national level. Now, to join, you have to have membership in one of these four different categories. You need to be a lineal descendant of a Mexican War veteran who served during the course of the war. You could also be a lineal descendant of General Taylor's Occupation Army of Texas. This was right after it became a state and right before the Mexican War starts. Our army, our regular army, was at the border anticipating a fight, and when it came, our army was already there. The third is a lineal descendant of John C. Fremont's expedition to California, 1845 to 1846. And finally, if you are a descendant of the California's Bear Flag Revolt, you can see the flag that was flown that same year of 1846. Now, they added a little bit to that, and what they added was that not only can you be a lineal descendant, meaning direct descendant, they now have opened up eligibility to those that are collateral descendants. So, descendants of siblings of the veteran, or one of these four criteria. You can now be a descendant off of a collateral line. And finally, they do have some research guides, keeping in mind that some of the links are bad. They are not active. They need to redo some of these links. But they do have limited amount of genealogy research. They do offer online a way to help you uh, perpetuate and move forward to get the copy of that compiled military service record or to get a copy of that pension file or bounty land file. But in truth, by simply listening to this webinar, you're getting the same information. 
you have all that same information inside of your syllabus with the links directly to how to obtain all the necessary documents so you can join this organization. There are two others that are now defunct. They're gone. They don't exist because they were only intended not for descendants like the other two. These were just intended for the veterans or their spouses. And because of that, when the last veteran or spouse died, the organization ceased to exist. The first one is the Association of Veterans of the Mexican War, founded by this man, Sergeant Alexander Kennedy. The organization was known as the National Association of the Mexican War and then simply changed their name. Internet Archives has printed minutes, reunions, and other genealogy material. I might suggest you also check Archive Grid, Addy Trust, by simply plugging in the name of the organization. This one and the one I'm going to share with you on the last slide. These organizations will help you determine if you had a family member who may have belonged and then when the organization died out as a result of their own death, you can still get more genealogy. Both organizations did share something in common. They both lobbied hard to have Congress pass legislation for the granting of Mexican War era pensions, which, of course, we know did happen. The female organization was called the Dames of 46, of 1846, founded in 1901 by this woman, Mrs. M. Moore Murdoch, who was also a Civil War uh, patron as well, belonged to the uh, Daughters of uh, Confederate Veterans, and she was active in both organizations, and like the predecessor organization, they really worked tirelessly at the passage of pension laws. And with her death in 1932, the organization ceased to exist. Now, uh, I'm going to share one last slide. I want to end as I began. And I want to talk a little bit about our history. Now, we should always remember it. Now, we should always have our history factual and not allow someone to do our thinking for us. Now, you're looking at this obituary and this man pictured on the right of the obituary. And this man is a War of 1812 veteran. So you're probably thinking and wondering, what does this have to do with the Mexican War? Well, I'm going to share that with you. When this man died, this is Hiram Crunk. He was the last surviving veteran of the War of 1812. When he died in 1905, there was a huge funeral that went down Broadway, and Thomas Edison was there with his film crew, silent film, obviously, and he took film of the funeral procession going down Broadway, and that film is only a few minutes long and is in the Library of Congress and is free to download to any patron who goes on their website. Look up Motion Picture, Library of Congress, Hiram Crunk and you'll find it. Shortly after he died, because the, his obituary was carried in almost every paper, it was a big deal. The man was the last War of 1812 veteran. There was this article placed in the New York Times, dated May 18, 1905. And this is where I want to end. The article was titled, Sad Indeed. While watching the funeral of the late Hiram Crunk, I heard one near say, he was in the Mexican War of 1812. Another contradicted him and said, no, it was the Civil War of 1812. And a third near him said, it was the Revolution, the Revolutionary War of 1812. No one in the crowd thought for a moment that it was the Second War with England. This is where I really want to end my, my focus on. What a sad thing for people not to know their own country's history. And I cannot think of a better way to end our time together. And think about that last sentence. What a sad thing for people not to know their own country's history. All of us that are listening to this and doing genealogy and research on our family, we're not like that article. We know our history. We know our personal history. 
We know our country's history. And because of that, we are educated. With that, I want to turn the time, and I want to thank all of you. And with that, I want to turn the time back over to you, Suzanne. I will stop sharing my screen. Wow, that was powerful. <laughs> I have learned so much from this. I, I, I am in awe. I really am. Uh, there's one thing while I'm waiting, uh, and I would encourage all the students uh, to please uh, put in the chat box any questions you have. But there were I a few things. <laughs> um, I have a few, just a few questions uh, while I'm waiting for them to uh, to put in any comments or questions that they have. Um, one thing caught my attention during your presentation, and that was you talked about the people who had uh, left without permission. Uh, they had, had deserted. Mm -hmm. um, is there like separate records? Um, I know you said if, if it would appear on their record if they had deserted uh, or if they had returned to service after desertion. But what about the actual desertion hunt? You know, uh, like what was it the, the military that went out and hunted these people down? And is there separate records for that process? Yes, there is. So there would be additional records because a file would likely be created and it would usually be the provo marshal that was responsible for that. Wonderful. Okay. Good. The reason that caught my attention so much is I do have a deserter <laughs> in my ancestry. So now I, I've, I've been wondering for a long time where I would go to find those additional. The National records. Archives will have that. I would I would focus directly on records of the Provo Marshal. Start there. If the archive staff has you directed to another record group, uh, that's fine. But that would be the logical place to start. Wonderful. Thank you. And then. Uh, what happened if a soldier died in Mexico? Were they buried in Mexico or were they brought back to the United States? That's interesting you brought that up because I did not talk about that. So Congress actually passed legislation as early as the Civil War for the creation of our first national cemeteries. So Arlington, Antietam, all those national cemeteries that we know and love today, where we know veterans are buried, where the sentinels guard the unknown soldiers, tombstone, and Arlington, was all came about because of the Civil War. But there was a passage of another act in 1850, and it was strictly for cemetery ground in Mexico City. It's a separate act. A lot of people don't even know it exists. So Congress passed an act essentially just allotting a, a, a certain amount of money for the building of a national or of a cemetery in Mexico City for the dead from the Mexican-American War. And it allowed for civilians, too, that were attached to the Army, like sutlers, those sort of teamsters, those sort of things. And then after uh, the National Cemetery System was created officially in 1866, that cemetery was added. Oh, wow. OK, that's wonderful to know. Um, and then also something else caught my attention during your presentation. Um, the word. ACT appeared on the Invalid uh, Pension Index. What does ACT stand for? Oh, it's just the word act. Oh, okay. It, oh, I thought I thought maybe it meant account as an abbreviation no, 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 or no. something like that. No, no. Pension Act. Gotcha. Just the word okay. act. Okay. And then uh, let's see here. Hold on. Um, oh, how did they find out a person's alias? Sometimes they found an alias based on the fact that the person was a deserter and then they would try to re-enlist under an assumed name. And the government is a lot smarter than we give them credit for. <laughs> so they do find things out very quickly. But men could enlist, they could enlist under a, an alias, just a name that they choose to enlist. I mean, you, you didn't have a driver's license, obviously, so you could assume another name pretty much at will. But the government is very quick to figure things out based on similarities in the individual's files, you know, when they enlist, unless you change things up drastically. That's how I think they figured that out. Okay. And then I assume then that um, I know in the Civil War, you could, uh, somebody could pay somebody else to, you know, to step in for them. Uh, right. was, that, was that the same in Mexican War? No. And I'll tell you why. And it's simply, uh, the reason is simple, is because there was no conscription. You got to remember, if you're going to hire a substitute to take your place, which was permitted in the Civil War, we had national conscription. We did not have it in the Mexican War. The first war in which we have national conscription is the Civil War. And we don't see that again until World War I. Wonderful. Okay. 
Why, that was all my questions. Uh, let me see here. Let me go into the chat box because I think before I posted my uh, my links here, I think there was a couple questions. Uh, let's yeah, see. I kind of turned the fire hose pretty wide on for them. I'm sorry about that. That's no, I thought it was wonderful. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's see here. One uh, Marlene says question for after the talk. I'm looking for William Henry Van Horn, who supposedly died in jail in Veracruz during the Mexican War. He was from uh, Niagara County, New York. I have been unable to find any information on his military service or death. Any suggestions, please? Okay, could she maybe tell us what state? He, she said he's from New York. Uh, let's see here. Uh, died in Veracruz. Uh, he was from Niagara County, New York. Okay. Um, maybe the reason she can't find him is because the compiled military service record is not online. So she needs to be able to contact the National Archives in Washington, request the uh, record of the compiled military service record, then go those next steps, search for the pension, search for the bounty land. Those are the three steps I would have her do. Excellent. He had okay. no pension. Oh, he had I, no heard, I heard a voice. Yes, he had no pension because okay, he died and had no widow. Okay, so no one, no one applied for a pension, no family member, is what you're saying. Probably not. He had brothers, but... Uh, other than that, he had no descendants. Have you checked under other uh, checked under names that are similar to his? Obviously, the spellings are not going to be. You saw that Peter Allabach. You saw the spelling was a change. Have you checked under spellings that are similar? Well, it usually doesn't get that far out. It, it could be a Van Horn with or without an e, or it could be Van Horn one word. But everything I checked uh, ended up with a dead end. And this was quite a while ago, maybe at least 10 years ago. Uh, well, re remember, I, that, remember that those unindexed bounty land records were not available 10 years ago. So now they are. They're but he doesn't have any bounty land records. He died in Veracruz during the war. Oh, he died during the war. Okay. All right. Was he, you, you say when he was from New York, was he regular army? No, he, I don't think he was. I don't think that that part of the family was army. He just like volunteered. Okay. So what I would be searching for next is I would then uh, I would contact New York from the state archives, in Albany. And I would see what records that Albany might be able to offer to maybe try to piece some of his life together. And then on top of that, I would be contacting the National Archives because he obviously was formally inducted into service. First and foremost, get the compiled military service record. That could answer a lot of your questions. But beyond that, I would be looking into Record Group 94 also for records of his unit's service. If he died in service, there's going to be a mention of it in his regimental record. Something with the regiment's going to have that. And I'm guessing it's going to give particulars. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, Connie wants to know if you have a website uh, that has the location that shows the pictures that you've accumulated over the years. Oh, uh, I'm st well, I have a lot of them. I don't you know. My own personal ones? Uh -huh. Well, the, you know, oh. the ones you mentioned uh, in the presentation. Yeah, I don't have them uh, online scanned right now. I'm working on it. I've got over a thousand. <laughs> oh, gosh, a thousand. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I got and, some and really, I got some really great images. I like and, to buy and, pictures that are iconic, too, ones that can be immediately recognized. I bought a photo a couple of years ago. I mean, everybody's heard of Wrigley gum, right? I mean, you've all heard of Wrigley. I found a picture of a Wrigley advertisement wagon taken in New York around 1905 with a full advertisement on the wagon. <laughs> I mean, it's a beautiful image. And I had it redone and had it doctored up so it looks brand new because it had rips and tears in it. So I'm I'm eventually getting this stuff online. Since I know a lot of my a lot of, a lot of the students in my class are veterans, and I I can't help but having to share with them uh, when you and I did the sound test the other day, you happened to mention you collect uniforms uh, for the I benefit do. of the veterans in my class. Could you maybe talk a moment about your 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 wonderful uniforms? Okay, so you can all see my picture behind me, right there. I have a, an original World War One uniform. Actually, I have more than one. I have another one right there, and I have yet a third one over there. <laughs> so what I do is I actually buy uniforms. I I don't try to sell them because once I buy them, 
I have this, I have the, I have the inability to want to part with them. <laughs> so I keep them and I buy uniforms for the purpose of identifying the wearer. And the one behind me is a air service one from the First World War. I have a particular fascination with World War One. The other one over here I showed you on the other side, again, just to recap, that's this one here. This is one from the uh, 55th United States Infantry. I found the daughter of the soldier still alive and interviewed her. And she shared with me pictures of her dad in the uniform. How, how, how I got the uniform is beyond me. I don't know how it ever left her hands, and she never shared that. But at the end of our conversation, I was with her in New Jersey for about an hour. Father was from Brooklyn, New York, and that's where she was born. And at the end of the hour, she asked me if I wanted the pictures of her dad in uniform. And I thought she was just going to give me copies. She said, no. She said, you can have the originals. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I was completely amazed. And I told her, I said, I guarantee you, I promise you, I will take good care of this. And I will honor your father's, you know, his memory. And I promised her that I would never sell that uniform. So what I do when I do World War I lectures, and I give a lot of them, uh, almost all my lectures are military. When I give any World War I lecture, I pack the uniform with me. And I take it. Because you should teach people genealogy stuff, yes, but let them touch the stuff from the wars. Uh, that's what I, I like. I, I, I tell you, I, I, that just puts chills all through me. I mean, I am so much you know, into eventually, air. Eventually, when this whole COVID thing is over and, you know, you can meet in person, I'd love to come and visit in, in person and bring some of my stuff for a topic. Oh, that would be wonderful. That would be let everybody touch it. Wow. You know, do you ever consider putting some of this into like a, a uh, an exhibit in a museum or? I or thought about it. I thought about it. I haven't actually committed to anything as at this point. Uh, I'm in the process right now of actually writing a book. So better than halfway done. So I'm writing a book on the Spanish American war right now. So very few, there's not a whole lot on it right now. And I love the Spanish American war as much as the Mexican war. Well, I love all the wars. But I have a particular interest in that war. So at the rate I'm going, I should be done by the end of the year. So wow. I'd like I'd like to have people that actually buy the book. Well, you, you provide me the information. I'll, I'll share it with my class. Absolutely. And I can and give, you a, I'll give you a lecture on it at the same time. <laughs> okay, that would be wonderful. Um, now, did you want to talk a little bit about your website before before we say goodbye? Yeah, that'll be fine. I'll just make mention of it. Uh, it's in the handout as well. I've given you my email. And if there's any question that comes up in any of your minds, um, you know, a week, week from now, two weeks from now or whatever, you're, I'm encouraging you to email me. You know, if I don't know the answer, I can certainly find the answer because I have lots of friends who are also military experts, colleagues. And between all of our heads together, Mushed together, I'm sure we can figure something out. So you're welcome to do that. And my website is all one word, uh, www.genealogyresearchnetwork.com. My credentials, my picture, my lectures that I give all over the country, all the past lectures I've done, all of my uh, education, teaching experience, it's all on there. All the articles I've written, everything. Well, I hope all my students will visit that. Oh, and then one last thing. I, I wanted to let you know, here in Nevada, um, in, in northern Nevada where we're located, uh, we have a John C. Fremont DAR chapter. Oh, and, I'd love um, to see that. Yeah, yeah. It's not my chapter. I belong to Battleborn, a, a different chapter here locally. But um, our, our neighboring community, just not too far from here in Minden, uh, their DAR chapter is John C. Fremont. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to see it. I'm just curious. Uh, you didn't tell me when we started, but – how many do we have here in the room today? Oh, uh, right now we're down to we're down to 18 people left, but uh, at the highest point we had 36, so the class was pretty full today. Okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I'm very very excited. Um, a lot of people have other classes they have to go to, you know. So I totally understand. Off, but because um, we do have students from the college that logged in today as well, so uh, okay. Well, I'm gonna if if there's no other, um, I don't see any other um, questions in the chat box. So with that, uh, everyone's saying thank you, thank you. I'm getting a whole bunch of people saying thank you right now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you very much for your time and your expertise. And I will be back to you uh, shortly. And I wanted to say thank you for allowing us to videotape today as well. 
Uh, that okay. will be on our school YouTube channel in the next, uh, probably next two weeks sometime. I'm, I have to wait for the marketing people to edit it. Um, but after that, it goes right onto the YouTube channel. I'll let you know. And I'll let, the rest of, I'll let the rest of the class know. Uh, if you'd like to stay online uh, for the rest of for the next hour, we'll be working on your trees individually or in groups. Uh, so with that, everybody who would not like to continue to stay online for the uh, research portion of the class, you can go ahead and just click on that red hang up button. And once again, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Suzanne. I will uh, wait to hear from you. And thank you for the time to talk with your class. And I want to do this again. We'll absolutely look forward to that. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye now.